Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do the Math. I'm Michael. I'm Devin. I'm Kate. For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636 4357. Everywhere else, 1 866 636 6284. Email do the math at kern.org. We're online at do the math online.net. And on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done, Kate. So, where do you attend school and what grade are you in? I attend school at Warren Junior High, and I'm in eighth grade. All right, and this isn't your first time on Do the Math now, is it? No. You're a seasoned veteran of Do the Math now because you've been here in sixth grade, seventh grade, now eighth grade, and was it twice during sixth grade? Because what was the other time you came in during that time? The other time I came in was for a quartet on Do the Math. And what kind of quartet was it? It wasn't just any. It was a violin quartet with. Um, three other classmates. Of right. Them. And so you were in sixth grade playing violin and how long before that point had you started playing violin? I started playing violin in uh, about first grade and I switched to string bass though in seventh grade. Okay. So you're doing more string bass now but you're still pretty proficient on the violin. Yes. All right. Everything going well with school? Yes. Well, so eighth grade you're getting towards the end of junior high. You've got about half a year left. What is one thing you're most anticipating, looking forward to in high school? Well, it's a lot more, I wouldn't say more diverse, but still even more diverse than it already is. Okay. And there's a lot more schools coming in than just Warren from before. So there's right, because more people. you were at Reagan. And then yes. you went to Warren, and probably at Warren you had, what, probably four different schools coming in there, maybe? I think so. Like Reagan, Buena Vista, maybe? Old River. Old River. So now you're going to have a lot of different junior high schools coming in yes. there. And people moving from different high schools, even, and things like that. All right. So you're still going to be uh, doing music and stuff in high school? I will be, yes. Excellent. And we were talking a little bit earlier, so... You anticipate what math course you'll be starting with in ninth grade. What math course do you think you'll be starting with? I think I'll be starting with pre-calculus. And that is awesome right there that you're going to start with that in ninth grade. So hopefully we uh, will give you some problems to work on today and you'll be like, all right, this is some easy stuff right here. So we'll do over some of your math homework today, all right? Okay. All right, before we do that, you need to help me out with today's social media problem of the day. You ready? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at it up on the screen together. So it says, what is equivalent to 15 yards? So first of all, there are going to be some students out there, Kate, that are going to go, what does equivalent mean? So what does that word itself mean? Equivalent is essentially just equal to. Right, it just means equal to. And 15 yards. So what, would you, what do you think of when you think of 15 yards? Well, I pretty much think of 45 feet right Okay, away. so how do you know it's 45 feet that quickly? Because there are three feet in a yard. Okay. Now... Look at the different options we have there. You know that 15 yards is 45 feet. You knew that right away. Yeah. So A, 30 feet, you already know that's not going to be it. Yeah. Why do you think they would have put 30 feet up there? Uh, if somebody thought maybe that there are only two feet in the yard. Good. All right. What about B, 14 inches? Why do you think that one's up there? Well... That's exactly uh, what I came up with also. I was like, I don't see a reason why they came up with 14 inches. Yeah. So we'll skip that one. All right. What about C, 540 inches? What do you think about that one? I think that that is the right answer. You think that's the right answer? I do. All right. Well, let's go to D, 43 feet and 12 inches. Well, 12 inches are in a foot, so that's just 
43 plus 1, which is 44 feet. And we already know that it's? 45 feet. Right, so we know A, B, and D are out. So you think C is correct. I do think And we C can is feel correct. pretty good about that by process of elimination, but how can we yeah. make sure? We can multiply 45 by 12 because there are 12 inches in a foot. And what is 45 times 12? So let's first of all do 45 times 10. Which is 450. And then 45 times 2. Which is 90. So 450 plus 90. Is 540. So you're feeling pretty good about C? Yes. You're willing to bet on this? Yes. Final answer? You're going to go C? Yes. All right, let's take a look and see if Kate is correct. There you go, C is correct. See, I think that's from all the years of you coming on Do the Math being here in 6th and 7th grade and now in 8th grade. So nicely done. That is today's social media problem of the day. Hey, you know what? Did you know that Holiday Lights at Com is coming up? It's actually started right now. Have you oh. heard about Holiday Lights at Com? Yeah, I used to go. You used, used to go? Oh. Yeah. Do you plan on going this year? I'm not sure. Well, you know what? All you have to do is call in to Do the Math any day between now and the next three weeks we do one of your math problems on air, you are automatically getting a pack to go see Holiday Lights at Com. So, we are here Tuesdays and Wednesdays, this week, next week, which is the third, no, fourth, fifth and sixth, I think, and then the 12th and 13th it must be. So, the next three weeks, call in to do the math, we do one of your math problems, you can go out and see Holiday Lights at Com, and they uh, had the brief banner right there for us to uh, get us it. in the mood for holiday there. lights That's right right. There. All right, you ready for today's Math in the News? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News has to do with gears. Do you know what gears are? I think so. What do you think of when you hear the word gears? If somebody says, I've got some gears, what do you think of automatically? Usually a circle of, or circles that have teeth on them. That have teeth on them? Yeah. Like these teeth? Well, teeth <laughs> like a comb. No, comb. I know what you're talking about. They're, they're, they have teeth around them. Yes. Okay. Would you say that this has some different gears on it? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So we've got a big one here, right? On the inside of it, there's another one. And then that gear is using its teeth to connect to another gear, which then spins another gear, which will turn another gear, which is all turned by this first gear, right? And we can see as it goes, all of the gears are working properly. Do you have any idea how old this is? No. How old do you think it was? How old do you think? What year do you think this was made? Well, it looks quite old, so I guess I would say the 1700s. 1700s? Yeah. That's a good guess. I mean, that. it's it's actually from the 1800s. Oh. Uh, do you have any idea what this is? I have no clue. Okay. It has to do with food. Okay, this is a blade. Oh. This is where you would put the food item. So oh. as the food item is turning, the blade is going across that food item and it's peeling. So it's an apple peeler. Oh. Now I'm sure you could look up an apple peeler and find one that it's a little bit easier to operate. <laughs> but we were going around looking for different gears. Mm. Can you think of anything in your life that uses gears? Now, you may not always see them because they're encased in something protecting them, possibly, but can you think of anything that you use that maybe has gears in it? Well, um, bicycles have gears. Yeah, bicycles, right? Yeah. Okay. So, as you're moving, right, that chain, and as you're shifting gears, right, yeah. that's exactly what it is, right? You've got all those different gears, okay? Yeah. Have you ever seen a... Uh, a bicycle bell? Yeah. Have you ever used one of those? Yeah. Have you ever taken the top off when it looked inside of it? No. If you get an opportunity sometime, take some kid's bell top off, right? Take a look inside <laughs> of it. You don't have to. Maybe you have one at home or maybe you're at a store or something like that sometime. And you can look inside, all right? Okay. So here we have gears and we can just take a look at 
what is a gear? So kind of like what you said, it's a rotating machine part having teeth, right, that mesh with another tooth part to transmit torque and speed. Have you ever heard it called COGS? I have heard of it. You have heard yeah. COGS. So this is going to go back. Devin, I'm sure you've heard it. Johnny also, and I'm sure Brian in the back. Cogs, well, Cogs. The Jetsons. Yeah. There you go. Right? The Jetsons, yeah. right? Cogs, well, Cogs, right? So, and uh, it, yeah, here's some gears in action. So, Kate, what do you think this first one is right here? Any idea what that is? Because we know that this is now an apple peeler. I wasn't quite sure what that is, but I found out from one of our producers, Mackenzie, what that is. Uh, well, it looks like it's to a, attached to some type of chest, kind of. So. Right. So what happens is you put the food in here, crank it, and it shreds oh. whatever it is that you're putting in, and it would come out on this other end. Right? Here's some gears, like inside of a clock or a watch. Mm. Right? Yeah. And then this, have you seen one of these? Uh, a whisk, kind of. Much like a whisk, right? But able to do more than a whisk because you're using the simple oh. machine to do more work for you, so it's a hand blender. Oh. So I'm sure you've seen blenders that are electric yeah. now, right? But this is before that, you had to use a. Uh, a hand blender right there. And we want to say, say thanks to Chris for uh, the apple peeler right here because he was kind enough to donate this to us because I was intrigued by this and he's, you know, we had a little discussion and uh, he was kind enough to let us use it on the show today. So we want to say thanks to Chris also for today's help in helping us understand a little bit more about the gears. And that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Kate, an eighth grade student from Warren Junior High is in studio with us right now. This is one of the problems you have from homework. So let's take a look at it together. And you guys are going to be graphing some inequalities. And it says, Y is less than or equal to 5. So you and Devin have got that up on the board. If you need to, you can write down that inequality. Y is less than or equal to 5. And Kate... Go to it. Tell us a little bit about, one, what this inequality represents. So this would represent, um, well, it's essentially like a constant function, but you would have uh, some that are right below and some that are maybe not right. Right. We need to show on this graph all of the values for y that would be less than or equal to 5. Yes. Now, there's an approach that most take when graphing an inequality. And I think for a lot of students coming in from earlier grades, like 6th or 7th, they've mostly focused on inequalities on a single line, like a number line. Yeah. Now we're working in another dimension here. So let's talk a little bit about how we might start off graphing what this line would look like as a linear equation y equals 5. How would we graph this equation? Well, y equals 5, that means that for every x value, the y value is going to be 5. So you'll want to count up to 5 on the y-axis. So 1, or <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. So the whole line will be on here. And so Every point here is going to be on that line. So let's go ahead and draw a line. Yeah, so we, we, what's great about this is that we can draw those lines. Uh, you actually, I think you could do this with just touch. Or let's draw, go ahead and just draw that line. Okay. We can get technical later about that. Now, would these stop here at these points on the x-axis with negative 10? This is going to continue on forever in perpetuity through to infinity and beyond. Now, this line represents y equals 5. And yes. every point on this line represents a value where it doesn't matter what x is equal to, y is equal to 5. Now, let's talk a little bit about this inequality, OK? Here, we actually want to represent every value on this coordinate grid where y could be less than or equal to 5. Yeah. Now, there's two components of this. First. 
do we include every point on this line? Since it is less than or equal to, we do. Okay, so that means that we're going to want to keep this solid to represent that all of these points count. Now, how do we show every other point in existence that would include everything where y could be less than 5 as well? What would you do here? We'll want to shade the parts that do fit that inequality. Okay. So let's go ahead and shade. Let's use a highlighter here or something a little bit thicker that will get us to shade a little bit better. Let's try a highlighter. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what color we use, but we can color in and shade in to represent every other piece. Now, would this be below the line or above the line? It's going to be below the line because it's less than. So what are some examples of some points where y would be less than 5 here? Well, say you choose 1, 4. Since okay. the x value won't matter, so just 4 is less than or equal to 5. Go ahead and graph that, 1, 4, as a coordinate. OK. So in what we've shaded below that line, this would count as a point where y is less than 5, or yes. less than or equal to 5. So let's go ahead and continue shading all the way through it. We started with yellow. Let's go ahead and continue with yellow. Go ahead and finish off with that. I think oh. we have to use. There we go. Yeah, touch should be fine to highlight all the way through. So to what point are you going to continue to color this? Do we stop at a certain point? No. Since there's no um, minimum value, we just keep shading. Right. Uh, and obviously, this coordinate grid yeah. does continue on through infinity in all these it directions. Does. But because we are coloring this all the way through to the end of the visible graph, we can presume that this will continue forward down and in each of these directions. So we have just shown a graph of y is less than or equal to 5. That includes every point on this line and everything beneath it. Yes. There you go. Nicely done. All right. First problem done. Come on over here. We're going to get you back into gears for a quick moment. So this is a puzzle where it's going to show you pieces that you must start with. So the red one is the one that you'll start, okay? This is the one that you'll eventually start to turn, and then all of the other gears must turn in unison. Make sense? Yes. So we can see that that's kind of down in that corner. Next, you have an orange one. And finally, you have a green one. So if you want to, go ahead and put those kind of where you think they would go based on what the drawing looks like. And down below it says that we misused two green ones. So you've got these two green that have to go on here somehow so that when you turn this, all five gears are turning at the same time. All right? So okay. you can move things a little bit if you need to. So go ahead and tell us kind of what you're thinking and why you're placing things the way you are. So we want everything to touch together in some way. So we'll probably need to um, make sure everything's touching. Right. For the <laughs> folks watching at home, this isn't as easy as you think. Like, just put it anywhere you want because there are holes in certain spots. And let's see if you got it. And then we'll see that when you twist the red one, it does work. All right. So go ahead and turn it once again. We'll make sure that they can see that they're all working in unison. Now, this is the way you solved it. Let's see if it's the way they've got it. Pretty close to it, right? Yeah. All right. So this one we could see was at the beginner level. So we're ready to move you up to another level in a little bit, right? Yeah. OK. But first, because of all the great work that you've done so far today, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Rock and Yolk Cafe. So congratulations on that. And we'll be back with more right after this. Hi, my name is Jesus Reyes, and today I'm going to be talking about integers on the number line. First off, what are integers? Integers are a concept in math that are only whole numbers. Some null examples of this are fractions and decimals. Let's do an example on a, on a vertical number line. So while making your number line, the example I'm going to do, I'm going to do increments of 10 
for me because I think it's easier for me to do. So all on the top of on the top of a number line, the numbers at the top are positive and the numbers at the bottom are negative. So as you go up, you do your positive numbers. So as you go to the bottom, you do your negative numbers by doing this negative line. The example I'm going to be doing is a weather report. Say the weather report said from the, te from the time 9 p.m. to 12 a.m., the temperature increased from negative 20 degrees to 10 degrees Celsius. Today, we're going to be finding out the, the temperature jump between negative 20 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. So let's count the distance. So we go 10, 20, 30. So this whole jump from negative 20 to 10 is 30 degrees. So see, so you put the little circle and see. On the horizontal number line, still you put your zero in the middle. The numbers to your right are positive. And the numbers to your left are negative. See, I'm playing a game and there's three rounds. In the first round, I got, in the first round, I got three points. So now I'm right here for right now. In the second round, I lost five points. So I go back five. So I go one, two, three, four, five. So in the second round, I'm at negative two points. In the last round, I gained six points. So I go from negative two, I go one, two, three, four, five, six. So my ending score of the game was four. And this is an example how you can use integers on a number line to help you with problems. And that's one thing students have a lot of difficulty with, it seems like, for a couple of years until they actually grasp it in whatever way works best for them, positive and negative integers. In studio with us, we have Kate, an eighth grade student from Warren Junior High, working with Devin on graphing inequality. So let's take a look at the next one. So we've got it up here underneath the camera, x plus 5y is less than 30. All right, you guys ready? Take Let's it away. Go. We've got a couple of other factors here. We have an x coordinate here that we have to consider. Show us how you would navigate this problem. So you can start off by plotting two points as if it were a regular line. So if it were x plus 5y equals 30. So we know that the um, the y-intercept is going to be uh, uh, 0, 6 because 5 times 6 equals 30 if x were 0. So you substituted y for 0 and then found out what x would be in that situation to find that point, okay? So let's go ahead and graph that. Or rather, what x would be as 0 and then what y would equal. So we're looking at 0, 6. Okay, so we have one point, and, and I think you're working towards the idea that if I have two points, I can make a line. Yes. Okay. So to find the second point, since the x-intercept would be much farther along the graph, you can uh, solve for y to um, plug in an x value. So 5y equals negative x plus 30. Now that negative on the x is going to come in very handy in a little bit because that tells us something about the line before we even work through it. Yes. So you divide by 5 on both sides, so negative 1 fifth x plus 30. Now what's interesting is that you've basically created this original inequality and turned it into slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So we have that constant of 30, we have that slope of negative 1 fifth. Since we know the slope, we can just use that to plot our second point. So it's rise over one, run, so you'll go down one and to the right five. So that's going to give us a point of five and f uh, five. Yeah. So now we have two points, five, we have a line. So yes. we can go ahead and create that line to represent negative one-fifth x plus 30. Go ahead and start on that line. Now, before you do, there's something about this line we need to draw, right? Yeah. Because now we're going to start to graph the inequality. Let's take a look at that. We know that x plus 5y is less than 30. Is it less than or equal to 30? No, so, it's only less than. 
So any points on that line actually would not fit that inequality. So what type of line do we need to draw then? We'll need to draw a dashed line because the line, it represents that those points on the line are not part of it. So let's go ahead and draw that line then. And we can go ahead and continue the other way. We want to make sure that there's some consistency with that line. And that, yeah, sometimes when we only have two oh, lines, really? some, some two points going in the other direction can be tricky. We can go ahead and undo that piece. If you follow the slope, I think what you're going to do is you're going to draw a third point or apply a yeah. third point so that you can connect that line, right? So going the other way, where would another point be on this function? So you'd go up one instead and to the left five. Great. Let's plot that. And let's just go ahead and just draw the line without worrying about the function for the sake of time, just to show that we can dash lines just as good as any tool could. Is this going to continue on forever? We'll yes. make sure we have so an arrow there. Have... Now, this is less than 30. So in terms of shading, what does that look like? So since it's less than, um, well, you'll first want to plug in a point into the inequality. Usually 0 comma 0 would be the best since just both x and y are 0. Great. So that would be 0 is less than 30 because 0 plus 0 is 0. And is 0 less than 30? Is that a true and statement? that is true. So, so we know what part we can shade then? You would shade um, where 0 comma 0 is. Great. So everything below this line, this dashed line representing y equals negative 1 fifth x plus 30 is going to be what we use to graph this inequality. Wonderful work, Kate. There you go. Kate's on a roll right there. Two of those inequalities done nicely. I appreciate it. I hope you saw that she looked at her hand to see if this was like coming off there. She kept going and it stopped. She looked at it as if it was like making well, contact. there's something on that board the right there. We something cleaned this, going I on. Hopefully something's not coming off. <laughs> anyway, we know that Kate is a, uh, a great musician. She was telling us that she started playing violin when she was in first grade. Time now for a little music and math. All right, right now we have the pleasure of having Anna and Abby in studio with us. They are from the Panama and Norse school districts and both in the music department. How are you today, ladies? Good. We're doing fine. Mm -hmm. Good. Nice to have you both here. You've got Kate, who is an experienced musician, so take it away. All right, Kate, we heard that you're quite the violinist. So I have a question for you. Have you ever heard the word duration? Yes. Do you know sort of what the word duration means? How long something lasts. That's exactly much. right. Duration means how long a sound or something lasts. And that's especially important in music. Anna, would you like to take it away? Yeah, yeah. So um, what the music math connection, like think of duration. I always describe it as distance that you can hear. It's like if you were to take a roll of toilet paper or something and throw it, hold the end of it, how long is it? You go and you, dis you, you measure the distance. That's duration. So you start a music note at a certain point, how long is it going to last? What's its rhythmic value? So um, actually, I'm going to start with the big one first. I'm going to grab the black marker here, and I'm going to squeeze by you here. Yes. So um, let's just create a rhythmic bank. There are more notes than what we're just going to show today, but these are some that you're probably already familiar with, being like music being the language that you already speak. So this right here is called a what? That's a whole note. It's a whole note. How many beats? That has four beats. Four beats. So four beats in duration. And then we're just going to cut that guy in half. How many beats is a half note? Two beats. OK, so it's so funny because a lot of times my students ask, like, why is it called a whole note? Why is it called a half note? Common time is four beats in a measure, usually. That's yeah. just very common in music. So a whole note is a note that would take up the whole thing. A half note would take up half of the thing because it's two beats long. And then below that, we have our quarter note. quarter note, which is worth one beat. Just one beat. Yeah, just one sound on a beat. Um, all right, and then we get to some of our subdivisions here. Mm -hmm. I'll take it away. To my so, little so far, we have a whole note four, half note two, a quarter note equals one. But then we can break it down even more. So we're getting to less than one. We're dividing it up. <laughs> we have an ape note which looks like this, and it has a cute little tail, and that takes up, do you remember? Half a beat. Exactly, one half. We have even smaller, 
Let's give it two. That's a sixteenth. A sixteenth. And it's, um, yeah, a fourth of a beat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But we can also pair these together to have them total one beat. So sometimes instead of this, I like to think about it as two together. Or, yeah. We'll connect them and then that now equals one. one beat. And how many of these would we need to equal our one beat again? Um, four of us. Absolutely. So we'll draw four of these, four of these sixteenths, beam together, give them their note heads, and it again equals the same as our quarter note, it equals one beat. All right, so let's take some of our um, units of sound really quick. Let's make some rhythms. So if you want to scooch on a little bit, I've drawn four heartbeats here. Um, so I like to think of rhythms as just how much, how many heartbeats do they take up? How much space do they take up? So I have four beats here just because, like we said, four beats to measure is common time. And uh, I'm just going to make a rhythm using our little rhythm bank here. And I'm going to use, when I do eighth notes and sixteenth notes, I'm going to use the barred type. I just like the way they look. I like the way that each of these takes up one beat. Um, so, do. And, and then how about one of these guys, too? Now, something about each of our rhythmic values is I like to give them rhythm words as well. I don't like to clap out rhythms and say like 16, no 16, it just, it doesn't quite fit. So we have rhythm words for each one. I'm going to teach you like my language <laughs> that I like to use. So it might be familiar with you. Um, so the whole note, I call that ta -wa. Let's try that. Ready? Yeah. ta -wa. And then splitting that in half, we have our half note, which would just be ta -o. Let's try that. Ta -o. And then our quarter note, we just call that ta. Yeah, you're probably familiar with that one. And then our barred eighth notes, I like to call that tt. Tt. And then our barred sixteenth, I like to call tika tika. Tika tika. All right, so let's read this little uh, beautiful little composition I made over here, and let's use our rhythm words and clapping all together. Ready? And t t ta ta. All right. You want to take it away? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do one too. How about I'll use another quarter note here? We'll call that ta, and then I'll use some sixteenth notes because those, those are, are fun. fun. Those are fun. So we call those tika tika ta. Tika Tika. PT. Aha. There we go. Cool. We could, we could clap this one too. All right, let's do it. Ready and ta. Tika Tika ta. TT. Can we do line one and line two? Yeah. Ready and TT ta. 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 Tika Tika ta. TT. All right, Kate, you want to do one? Do you like to do one too? Okay. I think you do. Beautiful. By the way, for our viewers at home, 16th notes have two beams on top to show that they're extra short because you got to fit four sounds within one beat. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, let's try this one that Kate just made. Ready and Tika 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 ta. Oh. All right, let's do one all together. Uh, what should we do? Maybe a whole note because we haven't done one what? yet. What? Okay, we sure could. All right, let's do all four measures. Ready and t t ta 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 tika tika ta t t tika 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 ta ta. I love it. One of my very favorite things to do, just to show like independence and musicianship, is like, is everyone really reading it themselves, or could we like make it a little more challenging? So here's what I want to do. I want to do me since we're standing on opposite sides. Mm -hmm. This is going to be me versus you two, um, and uh, you're gonna start. You're gonna start here with line one, two, three, and four. I'm also gonna do that in that same order, but I'm gonna start after you. I'm gonna start when you guys are here. I will start on line one. Okay. And why don't I put a repeat sign as well? And you just repeat this whole phrase when you're finished. Here we go. One, two, you go ahead and start. T T ta ta o ta tika tika ta T T tika 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 ta o 
ta tika tika ta titi tika 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 ta ta tika tika ta titi tika tika ta tika ta ta and stop oh it's so fun what if we did a three part round oh i want to all right so should we go one, two, three. Yes. Let's try it. All right, so here's how we can do this. Abby, you start. Kate, when Abby is here, you'll start on line one. And then when Abby's here on line three, I'll start on line one. Here we Perfect. go. One, two, ready, and. Ti, ti, ta, 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 tika, tika, ta, ta, ti, ti. Let's start again. Here we go. Okay, so it's okay. When Abby starts here, you're just going to start right on line oh, one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's okay. That's good. Here we go. One, two, here we go. Ti, ti, ta, ta, yo. Ta, ti, ti, ta, ti, ti, ta, ti, 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 ta, ti, ti, ta, 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 and I just love to challenge my students by having them create their own rhythms and not just say, here it is, learn it. It's just fun to try sight reading exercises where you say, here's your toolbox, make something. Or let's scramble it up. I even like to do a challenge every once in a while where we go, let's just start from the bottom and go backwards. Mm -hmm. Just do it in retrograde. So we could try something like that. This way, let's do this all together, not as a round. Let's give ourselves a break and just go line four, three, two, and one. Let's try that. Here we go. Ready and ta o a o tika 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 ta o ta tika tika ta ti 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 ta ta o. I love it. How about this? How about I'll go normal way. You guys go backwards. Yes. All together. Ready and ta ti ta ta o tika 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 ta ti ti. Tika 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 ta oh ta ti ta oh love it just like Anna and Abby I know that you guys yeah. love it and Devin and I are over here loving it also oh yes and I can tell you I am so glad that Kate is over there able to keep time and understand what you're doing and For Devin sure. probably could also <laughs> I know that if we went over there it wouldn't have been a ta oh ah ta oh <laughs> it is it could have been a whole lot worse than that. So yeah. I really do appreciate you expressing that language mm -hmm. of music with Kate and that Kate was able to create one on her own and you ladies were all able to partake in that together. So nicely done. Thank you very much for that. Thank as you. As far as uh, Devin and I, we just love the music, right? Oh, heck yeah. You're a guitarist and I love listening so to all the music. I got to play guitar in my high school orchestra as part of the string quartet. So like the bass piece because they didn't have a double bass or anybody tall enough or strong enough to actually <laughs> hold one of those up. Aww. And then I actually got to sing the national anthem at a New York Mets game as part of our men's choral ensemble at Staten Island Academy during the John Franco era. Oh, remember Way Franco? Back. Shea Stadium. That yep. place is Old gone Shea. now. Yeah. Anyway, that was great to have both of the ladies in from Norris and Panama school districts. And time now to check out what's going on this week at NASA. Some Artemis II astronauts check out some flight hardware, a mission that will map millions of galaxies, and studying disturbances in the atmosphere. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. During a recent visit to our Michoud assembly facility, NASA astronauts Reed Weissman and Christina Cook and Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen saw the core stage for the Space Launch System, or SLS rocket that will fly on Artemis II. Late next year, the three astronauts and NASA's Victor Glover will launch in an Orion spacecraft atop the SLS on Artemis II, the first crewed flight test for Artemis around the moon and back. Our SphereX space telescope is beginning to take shape. The observatory, with its distinctive cone-shaped photon shields, will sweep over every section of the sky and survey hundreds of millions of galaxies. The mission, which is targeted for launch no earlier than April 2025, will help scientists better understand where water and other key ingredients necessary for life originated, and will also create a map of the universe that far exceeds the color resolution of previous all-sky maps. NASA's Atmospheric Waves Experiment was recently delivered to the International Space Station. It will track disturbances in our atmosphere, known as Atmospheric Gravity Waves, or AGWs. 
At the mesopause, where the experiment will make its measurements, AGWs are revealed by colorful bands of light, known as airglow. AGWs can also contribute to space weather, which can disrupt satellite and communication signals on and around Earth. Our Pace spacecraft recently arrived for pre-launch processing at the Astrotech Space Operations Facility near our Kennedy Space Center. PACE will help us better understand how the ocean and atmosphere exchange carbon dioxide, measure key atmospheric variables associated with air quality and Earth's climate, and monitor ocean health. The mission is targeted for launch in 2024. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more about what else we're up to, check out nasa.gov. Well, that's what's going on this week at NASA. This week at Do the Math, we're giving away Holiday Lights at Com tickets. Our first caller to get those is going to be Peter. How are you today? Okay. Nice to hear from you. So you're in second grade, Peter? Yes. All right. And you're working it's on division? Like oh, okay. And you're working on some division right now, right? Yes. Let's hear the math problem you're working on. Um, nine divided by 1,000. 354. Peter said 9 divided by 1,354. Am I correct? Yes. All right. And is it 54 or 64? 54. With a 5 or a 6? 5. Excellent. Okay. okay, so we're good there. I was making sure. Woo! Well, Peter, whoever told you this is a fourth grade division problem, we got to align it. This is many, many decimal places down. There is so much we're going to work with here. And Peter just read it one way as a second grader, but you know that we're going to reverse those numbers. That would be yeah. a fourth grade problem. There we go. So what we're really looking yeah. at is we're taking this bigger number. My sister's in fourth grade. So it, I would presume right it looks like this, where you have the bracket in your book, right? So this represents actually 1,354 divided by nine. We are swinging these around and reversing the position. So we're taking this larger number and we're going to find out how many groups of nine can this total be divided into. Let's work bigger. We can start off with this larger piece and talk about how many groups of nine we can break into this group initially here of 1,300, 1,300. We'll get to the 54 in a little bit, and when we do, it won't take much. We know that if I was just to look at this as 13, essentially 1,300s, I can fit one group of 900s into 1,300s. So I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to work this out long division style. And keep in mind, Devin, that I believe Peter can hear things, but he's not able to see the screen right now also. So. Absolutely. So we're starting off by just dividing here. 1300s, how many groups of 900? That would just be one. We would have four groups remaining. Now, let's talk a little bit about this next. We're going to bring over our 50, that 50 piece in 1354, and we're now going to look at this as a group of 45 tens. So we have nine groups of 45. How many groups of nine can we fit into 45 tens? Well, I know that nine multiplied by 5 is 45. So I think that gives us an even value here of 5 groups. Now, that doesn't leave us with any 10s remaining. So all we have left is a group of 4 1s. Now, we know that we can't create a full group of 9 out of 4 1s, so that leaves us with 0 1s. We'll have 4 1s remaining out of the 9, which means that when we divide 1,354 by 9, that leaves us with a quotient of 150 with 4 ninths remaining. So there's a lot there, but you know, th that's a number that when we look at it, there's a lot of place values we have to work through when we're splitting this up into pieces. All right, hopefully that helps you out, Peter, and helps out your sister right there as well. And uh, based on the age that they're working on, we'll see how they need to put that answer and write it out. But they've got the answer of 150 and 4 ninths. So, Peter, for calling in this afternoon, you have got yourself a pass to Holiday Lights at Com. So, congratulations on that. Hopefully, you and your family have an opportunity to go do that. That is running all Thank through you. the month of December. You are very welcome, except 
for Christmas night. So that is the only night that they are not open through the month of December. And speaking of gears, we're going to check out some gears. As Kate said, they're on bicycles. Let's check it out right now. Well, it's a big day for gears, and we're at the perfect spot. Action Sports, and with us today is Sam. Nice Mike, to see you. Thanks for having me. You've been a partner of Do The Math for a long time. A few years. On a lot of different topics also, but I think your expertise is in bicycles, correct? Yeah, I've been in you know the bike industry and ridden bikes and raced bikes and still work on bikes for 38 years. There long you go. Time. So if you want to know a little bit about bikes and you need advice, come on down to Action Sports, ask for Sam. He'll uh, be here to help you out. But first of all, since we're talking about gears, let's mm -hmm. talk about the parts of a bike specifically aimed at the gears. Sure. Yeah, so we've got this uh, really pretty race bike here called the Trek Madone. And all the fundamentals of, of most bicycles, with a few exceptions of newer technology, with belt drives and things like that, are still pretty much the same as they've always been. So what we've got that makes up the drivetrain is you have the shifting mechanism, which is located here on the handlebars. Sometimes on bicycles, they'll be in different positions. On older bikes, they're down here on a portion of the frame. But this is kind of where things start, so this is how you actually change the gears. And depending upon the bike, you'll have shifters for the front mechanism and for the rear mechanism. Some bikes only have a rear mechanism and no front mechanism. These two components are called the derailers. So the derailers are what derail or shift the chain in and out of various uh, gear configurations. This is called the crank set, uh, and these are referred to as the chain rings. And this is the chain, obviously, and then this is what we call the cassette uh, and, or, and or our rear gears. I remember when we were growing up, we were like, oh, we got a three speed or a seven speed. And right. then it was 10 speeds, and now you can get up to 21 speeds and even higher, I take it, right? Even higher. There are some drivetrains now that have 13 cogs in the rear of the bike. 11 and 12 is still the most common. Different configurations of the front chain ring and different configurations of the rear cogs create different, uh, different gear combinations. And then there are still some bikes, Mike, that are very simple one speed, three speed, five speed, seven speed. Uh, it just kind of depends on the design and style of the bike. When you shift is kind of important also. Yeah, so the, the combination of, uh, of gears really is also sort of related, if you're doing it correctly, to leg speed and cadence. So RPMs or revolutions per minute play uh, into that. And the other factors that contribute to it is how fast that person wants to go, so how much exertion they're going to put out, uh, the terrain, uh, and to include wind and other factors. Uh, and then wheels and tires and other things. But for the most part, we like to have them use those gears to their advantage to keep a certain revolutions per minute and a range. We like to see that above 70 revolutions per okay. minute. Okay, let's get into what a, a lot of students will hear, gear ratio. Yes. And what is that and how do you figure that out? So gear ratio is, in, in the most basic form, it's the distance that the bicycle will travel in one revolution. So I guess technically ratios are gonna be the two combinations. So the size of the front chain ring or rings and then the size of the rear cog uh, or cogs, depending upon which gear you're in. So for some of your students or other people that may have ever looked inside of a, of a drill press, it's a very similar uh, conical scenario. You've got a smaller cone here and a larger cone here or vice versa. And basically the same thing happens with a bicycle. As you increase the size of the ring in the front, the gear gets harder. And as you decrease the size of the cog in the back, the gear gets harder. So that bigger to smaller combination makes the bike harder to pedal and it takes far more distance for the bicycle to travel. The smaller the ring in the front and the larger the cog in the rear, it's the opposite. The bicycle will travel a much shorter distance in one revolution. Okay, now that you've brought up both the front and the back, is that where cross training comes in? Sure, so you know we're, we're talking about the number of speeds in a bicycle and going from a single speed to you know a now 11 and 12 or 13 speed race bike or even a casual bike. Uh, you were asking a lot of the drivetrain, and so there's a lot of lateral load and, and, and some geometry that comes into place. What we really want to try to avoid with drivetrains that have so many speeds is to stress that chain. Mm -hmm. So when you're in those larger rings in the front, you really kind of want to avoid being in the larger cogs in the back. It actually you know, takes the chain so far sideways that it creates a lot of stress. And so we're tightening the chain that causes the derailing body to have to pull really, really hard. And then vice versa, and when you're in that smaller ring, uh, and as you go towards the smaller cogs in the back, the chain becomes very slack, the drivetrain becomes very noisy. Talk to us about the gear and the size of them and speeds and cadences and things like that. Sure. Got. So this is a, a little gear inch calculator that's available online. The way this is designed is you can put in the size of the wheel, uh, the size of the tire, 
When they talk about chain ring, the chain ring refers to the, the front uh, chain rings here, and then sprockets refers to the cogs in the back. Okay. So this particular chart has all the most common combinations of sizes of sprockets and sizes of rings. It basically does what I was describing earlier. It shows the, the uh, distance in inches of how far the bike will go given a certain gear combination. Well, you know what? Fascinating. There is a lot of math behind the gears, sprockets, cogs, chains, and things like that. Uh, but anyway, Sam, once again, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And just a little bit more on gears. A big thanks to Action Sports and Sam, who's been a friend of the show for many, many seasons now. And the latest one on gears. Kate, an eighth grade student from Warren Junior High, has been working with gears and also graphing inequality. So you've got one more, Kate. Take it away. In this instance, it looks like we have the inequality of 3x minus 3y greater than or equal to 21. So here, not only do we have an x and a y to contend with, they both have coefficients. So walk us through how we can graph this inequality. So to start off, you want to treat it like a normal equation again. And this time, we can use the um, intercepts of the equation to graph it because they fit on the given uh, domain and range. So we're going to treat this as if it's 3x minus 3y equals 21, and we're going to find out where this linear equation intercepts the x-axis and the y-axis. To find that out, you'll want to have each of them be 0 separately. So if uh, x equals 0 first um, to find the y-intercept, then uh, it's negative 3y equals 21. So um, that leaves that y equals negative 7. So, so we would graph that as a coordinate where y equals negative 7 when x equals 0, or 0, negative 7, right there. Now, we'll do the other side of this, too, and, and treat y the same way, correct? Yes. Okay. So. Let's go ahead and have y equal 0 here. So in this case, y equals 0. What does that do with uh, the rest of the equation? That leaves um, 3x equals 21. So divide it by 3 and um, x equals 7. So x equals 7 here when y equals 0. So this coordinate's going to be 7, 0. OK, well, we have two points here. It looks like we have a line that we can connect and draw here. Um, now, before we draw the line, let's look back at our original here. What type of line will this be? Since it's greater than or equal to, it will be a solid line. So go ahead and draw this line. Uh, you can use the tool or you can draw it. Do we want this to be solid or dashed? Oh, uh, we want it to be solid. Let's create a solid line. All right. Now, if we need to change it to make sure that it fits through there, we can do so. Let's go ahead and grab this line and drag it so that the points go through both. A little fine-tuning there. And this is going to go infinitely in both directions. So we have our function. This is the function of 3x minus 3y is equal to 21. But now we have the inequality part. It's time to get shading. Which side of this line would we shade? So we can plug a point like 0, 0 into it. Um, so that would be 0 is greater than or equal to 21, which is false. So we know that can't be the case, which means we can't shade in the portion that has the origin, that 0, 0. Yeah. So what would this shading look like here? So then you would have to shade the other part of the graph that doesn't have that point, which is this part. So we highlight the perimeter and then fill in everything inside. <laughs> And that's going to get us our graph. So this is the graph of the inequality. 3x minus 3y is greater than or equal to 21. And what's interesting about that is I think a lot of people would presume, that, well, just because it's greater than, that would mean that it's above. But here we prove that if you plug in one of those points, it doesn't fit the expression, the equation. So we know that the opposite has to be true there. So don't always presume that because it's greater than or equal to, it's going to be above. Because above can mean a lot of different things in this point. Plugging it in, proving where it goes, and then following through with that is going to help you get that precision and accuracy that you've been able to demonstrate here, Kate. Wonderful job. I'm glad you brought that point up also, Devin, because a lot of students would do exactly what you said, greater than, so it's going to go on the other side without checking the point first. All right, Kate, have you ever heard the expression, get it into gear? 
Yeah. All right, we'll get it into gear over here. Let's go, sister. You got one more to do. All right, so now we're going on to the intermediate level, all right? So we can see that you've got two cogs that you need to start with. So you go ahead and place those wherever you think, kind of approximately where they are on the puzzle there. And it says that you may use three of the green ones. So there are the three green ones. You can place them wherever you'd like. And we'll see if you can get all of those gears to turn in unison. That will we'll give you about three minutes. You think you can do it in three minutes? Probably. Probably. All right. Um, you got, so you're out of, you get a good start. Yeah, I started by attaching it to the first one. So next, I'll probably want to just continue the line until. Okay. So it makes sense. Yeah. Um, until we can find a way to have all three of them connect. Or, yeah. And it seems like the last one's always the most difficult, isn't it? Usually, I think. <laughs> You've got three out of four. There that. Now let's see. Yeah. All right, so go ahead and rotate that first one. All right, so they're all turning in unison. Let's see what the... So it's pretty similar to what you had right there, right? Yeah. You ready for another one? Okay. You did that one pretty quickly, so here we go. Yeah. All right, so let's try this one. So let's get these off. So we need to replace. You need a, an orange. You have one green and one orange to use. All right, go to it. So, so you've got about 90 seconds on this one. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so they've got it at the top, which is fine. Yeah. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Have you ever thought about doing anything with gears? Can you think of any occupations where you would have to do this kind of stuff? Well, definitely some type of engineering. Mm -hmm. There you go, nicely done, all right. So you've got that. You know what? We've got a minute left. Let's skip the other intermediates and we're gonna go to the advanced. All right, let's see if we can get one of these done quickly. So let's see, we need another one of those. And then it says you can use three orange and one green. And you're well on your way. You've got about 45 seconds. <laughs> all right, you're on a roll. You got the system down now on how all of these work. And remember, you can move them a little bit if you need to. And you've got one more gear to put in there uh. after that one. Right? <laughs> Ooh, looks like it's going to work, maybe. Coming down to it. Will uh. Kate get it done in the amount of time? Ooh, very close. So, Kate, while you're doing this, did you learn a little something today? I think so. Good. Did you have fun today? Definitely. There you go. Well, we're glad that you were able to make it back. You've been here in 6th grade, 7th grade, and 8th grade. And guess where you're going to be next year? Here in 9th grade. That's right. You're going to be right back here with us again. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.